All right, the last part of chapter 22 is looking at conjugate addition reactions. And let's briefly go over conjugation again. We talked about this a lot last term where we said that this system is conjugated. Why would this system be considered conjugated? Resonance and it's alternating double single bonds, right? If we compare these two, we said that the one on the right is going to be non-conjugated simply because it has this sp3 carbon. And you can't delocalize through an sp3 carbon, right? So this one on the left is conjugated. The one on the right is non-conjugated. And we can take this further and we can talk about it in terms of ketones and aldehydes. If we look at this ketone, this ketone is conjugated because if we look at it, it's got alternating double single double bonds versus a ketone that might look something like this. The one on the right is non-conjugated because it has this sp3 carbon stuck in between the two. So we've got conjugated and non-conjugated. And if you remember back to last term, we said that we can do addition reactions to conjugated molecules, and we can get 1-2 addition, or we can get 1-4 addition. You guys remember covering all of that? Thermodynamic versus kinetic products. Feels like an eon ago. So let's make a little note of that, and we'll talk about how this relates to the ketones now. So conjugated... molecules can react in a 1-2 fashion or a 1-4 fashion. So when we're talking about just conjugated carbon systems, 1-2 means the protons getting installed right next door to your nucleophile versus 1,4, that proton separated out a few more carbons, right? So let's take a look at this with our conjugated system with the ketone. Let's draw out the resonance structures for this. We could say, all right, we could pull up electrons onto that oxygen. If you do this, the oxygen's got a negative charge, the carbon's got a positive charge. Or we could pull these over, and we can move that positive charge around a little bit more. So that the positive charge is now located over here. When we're talking about 1, 2, 1, 4 addition with ketones and aldehydes, we're referring to the position of the nucleophile in relation to the oxygen. So if we look at this system right here, we've got one, two. If we had a nucleophile attack right here, it'd be a one, two addition, versus over here, it'd be one, two, three, four. But the important thing to remember is with these conjugated ketones and aldehydes, you actually have two different sites on the molecules that have that partial positive character. So we've got two different electrophilic sites. All right, if we want to do 1-2 addition and we want to add a nucleophile straight into that ketone, we could use a really strong nucleophile and we've already seen examples of this. What strong nucleophile could we use to add directly into a ketone? A Grignard reagent, right? So we know Grignards are carbons with that negative charge. They're really, really strong nucleophiles. They're just going to slam straight into that two position. So strong nucleophiles tend to favor one, two addition. So strong or unstable nucleophiles 
favor one, two, addition. That is to say, we'll add to the carbonyl carbon. And weaker stable nucleophiles favor 1 4 addition. <coughs> Meaning they're going to add to that carbon that I labeled in that top right as 4. Another way of um, referring to 1,4 addition is beta addition because remember if we're looking at our ketone the alpha position is one carbon away from the carbonyl and beta is over here so 1,4 addition is often called beta addition. Another semantic thing that people refer to these reactions as is they'll call them 1,4 addition, uh, beta addition, or conjugate addition. So you'll hear all three of them used interchangeably. So this is referred to as conjugate addition. Yeah, 1, 4 addition and conjugate addition are synonymous, or beta addition. Unfortunately, people can't make up their mind what they want to call it, so they can just use all three of them. <laughs> all right, let's take a look at an example. And we'll do a little bit of review from last week. Let's say I've got this aldehyde, and I treat this with sodium hydroxide. and heat. What product will I get out of this? So I'll give you guys a minute to come up with the product. But try to do the full arrow pushing just to review what we covered last week. Give you guys a hint with the alpha protons there. <laughs> Does anybody remember the name of this reaction? Close. Clazin is when you have an ester, an aldol. And is this going to be an addition or a condensation reaction? Condensation. We've got heat there, so we're going to drive off the water and get a double bond. So if we look at this, first step is going to be deprotonating an alpha carbon. We know that Sodium hydroxide is not the greatest base. We should really represent this with an equilibrium. So I'll just change this. <laughs> so we've got our enol, or our enolate, excuse me. We know a good portion of it's still going to be the aldehyde form. So this will attack into any remaining aldehyde. Now that we've got our addition, we need to do some proton transfers. So we've got, we've got water around. This can come grab a proton from water. I'm going to clean this molecule up a little bit. 
and then we've regenerated hydroxide. And what will happen next? We've got alpha protons. Attack alpha protons, clamp down, and like I said, this is the one weird example where it's okay to kick off hydroxide. Hydroxide is normally not thought of as a good leaving group, but in this case, it will work. And now that we've got this, we've created a conjugated aldehyde. Specifically, we would call this an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. And our byproduct, we said, would be hydroxide plus water. OK, so now we've got this conjugated system. We can go on and we can react this further. So I'll give you guys two sets of reagents, and I want you guys to predict what the product would be when we react it with this aldehyde. The first reagent I'm going to give you will be methyl lithium. The second step in this is just going to be treatment with weak acid. What do you think we'll get out if we treat this alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde with methyl lithium? Is it going to attack the carbonyl carbon or the beta carbon? It's a lot of quiet in here. <laughs> It's going to attack the carbonyl carbon. So if we think about lithiates, that methyl group has a negative charge on it. That's very, very unstable, very reactive. It's going to attack directly into that carbonyl carbon. And so what you'll get out when all is said and done is a methyl group. And then the double bond just kind of hangs out off to the side. So this would be an example of 1-2 addition. And we said that this is favored by strong nucleophiles. All right, let's say I want to add a methyl group onto the beta carbon, though. What's a way to make uh, carbon nucleophilic, but not as nucleophilic as a Grignard reagent? Does anybody know of a reagent that does that? The Gilman reagent, right? So we said if you want to um, add in a, a carbon-based nucleophile into an acid halide, you can use the Gilman reagent, and it will stop at the ketone and won't continue to add in uncontrollably. And the Gilman reagent is the lithium dialkyl cuprate. So that's R2. We'll just do Me2, C-U-L-I, followed by weak acid. And in this case, this is a much more gentle nucleophile than a lithiate or a Grignard. So we'll install the methyl group in the beta position. So we'll do one four addition. Oops. This is favored by weaker nucleophiles. What's that? Are you talking about the aldehyde? We'll go into the mechanism next, but what I, I'll, I'll just let you guys know that this methyl group right here is adding into the beta position as opposed to that carbonyl carbon. We'll go over the mechanism next. Yeah, we'll go through that. Bat, uh, <laughs> sorry. Let's actually just go through and do this. <laughs> Let's do the conjugate 
addition mechanism and I'm just going to use a generic nucleophile so I'll use NU minus right? and we said if you think about this that there's a resonance form where you've got a positive charge on this carbon and a negative charge on that oxygen, right? And so with conjugate addition, we're going to favor attack at this beta carbon. So this nucleophile will attack in. Okay. Oops. Let me clean this up. So we still have that double bond there. We've got our nucleophile right here. We've got oxygen with the negative charge. So right now we're at our enolate. And then if we treat this with acid, let's actually do the full mechanism. This negative charge will get protonated. Actually, let's even speed this up into a faster step. This will clamp down, grab a proton, kick electrons over, and now you've got your aldehyde. So the double bond completely disappears from the reaction, but the carbonyl CO double bond stays. Does that make sense? So we've essentially added in a proton right here. All right, so let's take a look at a type of reaction that's based on conjugate addition, and that's called the Michael addition reaction. So Michael additions are conjugate additions, but they're conjugate additions that use really stable nucleophiles, meaning that they really don't like to attack the one-two position at all, and they're resonance stabilized nucleophiles normally. So let's make a little note. Conjugate addition using resonance stabilized carbon ions. as nucleophiles. And usually it uses resonance stabilized enolates. So let's take a look at an example of a Michael addition reaction. Let's say I've got this ketone, or diketone for that matter, and I treat this with sodium hydroxide. So I'll just have OH minus. We know that the alpha protons right here and here are unusually acidic because they're in between two ketones. So now we've got a resonance stabilized nucleophile. So let's make a little note of that. And with the Michael addition, we're going to use this nucleophile to do a conjugate addition reaction. So in the next step, we'll just use that same aldehyde. So we'll do step one. And then step two is to treat this with acid. So now that we've got this nucleophile, it's going to attack the beta position kick electrons over and up. Wow. 
And then the last step, like we saw in the previous example, is to treat this with a weak source of acid. So this negative charge will clamp down, reform that carbonyl double bond, and then this carbon will reach over, grab the proton, and we'll switch over from our enolate to our aldehyde. Does that make sense? It's a pretty straightforward reaction. The resonance stabilized nucleophile is normally referred to as the Michael donor. And then the thing that you're adding it into, the conjugated system, is called the Michael acceptor. Because it is the thing that the nucleophile is attacking. In this case, because the nucleophile is so stable, it's not strong enough to add directly into the carbonyl, but it is strong enough to attack that beta position. There's a handful of really common Michael donors. Oftentimes they're diketones like this, but I'll show you guys a few other ones. So common Michael donors. The first one, like I just showed you, is to use an enolate. It's a 1,3 diketone something where that negative charge can delocalize really easily. You can also use the diester variant. These are also really good Michael donors because that negative charge, like the diketones, can resonance stabilize. You can use a mix of the two. So a beta keto ester. Enolate is also a really good Michael donor. The other one that you might occasionally see in the Klein textbook is one where you've got a nitrile. That nitrile is really electron withdrawing, so that stabilizes that negative charge a lot. The other one that's pretty common is when you have a nitro group. Those alpha protons next to a nitro group are really acidic due to the inductive force of that NO2 group. And then the last one we saw was the lithium dialkyl cuprates or the Gilman reagents. That's a really nice way of installing single alkyl groups into that beta position. These are all really nice Michael donors because they are all highly stabilized. So they're all highly stabilized carbon ions. Yep? In conjugated systems that are a lot larger, do we see additions to the carbons that are farther away from the carbonyl by delta addition? So you're saying when you've got conjugation that extends beyond just one double bond? Yeah. Yeah, you do occasionally see um, reactivities like that. In the Klein textbook, and as far as we're concerned, though, we're just looking at alpha, beta unsaturated systems, but you're correct. You occasionally might see weird reactivities like that. All right, let's take a look at another question. Let's say I give you guys cyclohexanone. And step one, I'm going to have you deprotonate it with LDA. Step two, we're going to use the simple alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. And then step three, you're going to treat it with acid. The main question becomes, will your enolate attack the green carbon, meaning that carbonyl carbon, or will it attack the beta carbon over there? We know that positive charge is delocalized across the blue and the green carbon. 
which carbon do you think it will add into, or do you think it could add into both? And which one do you think it would add into more likely than the other? <laughs> So let's compare the two products we would get out. So that would be attack at the beta carbon shown in blue. The other one we said would be at the green carbon. So we could potentially get two different products. Which one do you think is going to be major and which one do you think is going to be minor? Does anybody want to throw out a guess? What's that? Blue is major? So in this case, if we look at this one, this would be the um, conjugate addition, right? This would be our 1-2 addition. If we're thinking about a Michael reaction, we would definitely add into that blue carbon. But the problem is, once we deprotonate this with LDA, we end up with an enolate that's not resonance stabilized. So this is an unstable enolate. And we'll do one, two addition. And one, four addition. Because it's so unstable, it doesn't really have that much control over which carbon it attacks. And in fact, if you do this experimentally, what you'll find is that you'll actually get more of the one, two addition and the conjugate addition will be your minor product. But there's a clever workaround. The main thing we need to do if we want to get conjugate addition is find a way to stabilize that nucleophile so that it doesn't try to attack that carbonyl carbon. And in order to do this, we utilize a reaction called the Stork enamine synthesis. So let's take a look at this workaround. So with the stork enamine synthesis, or the stork enamine workaround, we said that the main problem is if we treat this with LDA, we get an unstable nucleophile that will do one, two addition. So unstable will react at carbonyl carbon. The workaround is to convert this ketone into an enamine. So what sort of amine do we need if we want to convert this into an enamine? Should it be primary, secondary, tertiary? Secondary amine. So secondary amines favor enamine formation. We need catalytic acid. So I'll just write generic H plus. I'll do H N R two. Oftentimes you'll see diethylamine just because it's cheap. It's available in most labs. And you also drive off water in this reaction. Now once you've got this enamine. This carbon, all of a sudden, is a really gentle nucleophile. Why? Does anybody want to throw out a speculative guess? Yeah, exactly. When in doubt, resonance. So if we think about the resonance structure for this, 
there's a minor contributor where that carbon now just has a partial negative charge on it. So we'll bracket these in, and now all of a sudden this is resonance stabilized. Whoops. And it prefers conjugate addition. So it's a pretty simple way to change a unreact or a overly reactive enolate into a more stable enolate that will uh, attack at that beta position instead. So this is our enamine workaround. All right, now that we've got our more stable nucleophile, we can throw this in with that same aldehyde. So this is our Michael acceptor. This can attack, attack, and kick up. So we're going to push all the arrows around. Got a negative charge here. Still have this nitrogen hanging out with the negative charge. And so if we look at this, we've got an enolate. And over here, what would we call this functional group? We saw it in the pod. Close, it's not a true imine because it's got a positive charge. So we call it an aminium functional group. So we'll circle this and we'll say aminium functional group coming off. How can we get rid of that aminium functional group and go back to the ketone? See? Anybody remember? Water and acid, exactly. So we're just going to hydrolyze our aminium functional group. This is all old chemistry that we've seen. And when we treat this with acid, that enolate's actually going to interconvert to the aldehyde. So all of a sudden, we've killed two birds with one stone. And we've removed that aminium functional group, and we've changed our enolate back to the aldehyde. So this is a really novel workaround um, for doing Michael additions. All right, let's do a little bit of practice. I'll give you guys some time to work on this. First thing we're going to do is propose a synthesis, starting with this ketone. What would we call this ketone? What would it be called? 3-pentanone. I was going to say, otherwise I'm going to put this on the exam. <laughs> All right. I want to convert this into this compound. And you can use other carbon reagents as necessary, but we want to make it as efficient as possible, so we don't want to get a mixture of products out. So let's try to use some of the more recent synthetic te techniques that we have. You guys seem a lot less rowdy than normal today. I don't know what's going on. Everyone's like quiet and like putting their head on their desk. <laughs> Thank you. 
People drop in week seven. Really? Week <laughs> seven. It's like reaching mile 20 in a marathon and failing. You're so close. I can imagine. All right, so I'll show you guys the easiest retro synthetic trick for this chapter. We've already covered this. Identify your alpha and beta positions and then use invisible scissors, right? So we've got alpha <laughs> and beta right here. So we can cleave this apart, right? If we look at this whole half of the molecule, that's the same as over here, right? So the question is, what other reagent do we need? Yeah, exactly. So if we look at this, this must have been some sort of conjugated ketone, right? And if we think about it, can we just toss in LDA with our three pentanone and then have it attack? No. no, we just said with the stork enamine workaround we can, but we can't treat it directly. So let's kind of go in the forward direction. What we need to do is first convert our 3-pentanone into an enamine. So we'll do just catalytic acid. We'll do some sort of secondary amine. We'll remove water. Now we've got our enamine. After we've got our enamine, then we can treat this with our alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. Let me do it like that. And then step two, we'll treat this with acid in order to give us our final product. So it's really not that bad. The main thing is identify that alpha, beta position, cleave that apart, and then double check to make sure that um, you're choosing an appropriate nucleophile. If it's too strong, you'll get a mixture of products, in which case you need to do the stork enamine workaround. Make sense? All right, there's one last reaction for the chapter. I promise this is it. Boo. There we go. The last reaction for the chapter is called a Robinson annulation. And a Robinson annulation is just a hybrid reaction. It's a Michael addition. Followed by an intramolecular aldol. So let's take a look at this reaction. First thing we need to do is a Michael addition. So I'll just use this 
ketone because we've already seen it. And we're going to treat this with sodium hydroxide to form our resonance stabilized nucleophile. And we're going to have this do a Michael addition. And let's just pick this nucleophile, or sorry, this uh, Michael acceptor, where we know that it's going to attack the beta carbon, clamp down, and kick up electrons. We've got water around, so this will quickly tautomerize back to the keto form. So this negative charge will clamp down, this carbon will grab a proton, Oops. and we've now got a ketone. All right, now that we've done that, we've got hydroxide around. Question is, where will this hydroxide grab protons from? It's got a bunch of different sites, but I'll show you guys which site is most likely to occur, and then see if anybody can figure out why. Why did I pick those alpha protons as opposed to any of the other ones? It's kind of subtle. It's tricky. I'll give you a hint. I'll put a number one and a two. <laughs> If you notice, if we keep on numbering out, three, four, five, six, it's six carbons away from a good electrophile, right? So what will happen in a Robinson annulation is after we've deprotonated this carbon, if it can form a six-membered ring, it will. Yeah, four-membered rings are too ring-strained to form readily, but a six-membered ring is highly favorable. And now that we've done that, we've got water around. That means that this can grab a proton from water and finish the aldol condensation. We've got OH. We've got hydroxide that reformed in this reaction. We've got some alpha protons here and here. This, whoop, this can come grab an alpha proton, clamp down, and give you your condensation product. So Robinson annulations, a really nice way of forming a new six-membered ring. Um, I believe so, but six-membered rings are far more likely than five. So if you go through the literature, six-membered rings are the most common ones. This will help you with your problem of the day, too. Hint, hint, wink, wink. All right, I think that's where we're going to leave it today. Tomorrow we'll do a bunch of practice problems, and Wednesday will be synthesis.